Mark Twain once wrote, it is better to keep your mouth closed and let people think you are a fool than to open it and remove all doubt. As you will see, I couldn't follow his advice. <clears throat> it's maybe, it may be useful to consider the usage of the word theosophy in publications which are independent from the Theosophical Society. The Oxford Dictionary, for example, says that theosophy is any of a number of philosophies maintaining that a knowledge of God may be achieved through spiritual ecstasy, direct intuition, or special individual relations, especially the movement in, founded in 1875 as the Theosophical Society by Elena Blavatsky and Henry Still Alcott. In the Wikipedia, of course, I have been told that you have to take whatever is in the Wikipedia with a pinch of salt, but there is also some serious research there. In the Wikipedia, we read that theosophy refers to systems of esoteric philosophy concerning or investigation seeking knowledge of presumed mysteries of being and nature, particularly concerning the nature of divinity. The same source also adds the word Theosophia appeared in both Greek and Latin in the works of early church fathers as a synonym for theology. The Theosophoi are those who know divine matters. During the Renaissance, the use of the term diverged to refer to Gnostic knowledge that offers to individ the individual enlightenment and salvation through a knowledge of the bonds that are believed to unite her or him to the world of divine or intermediary spirits. By the 16th century, the word theosophy was being used in at least one of its current meanings. There is yet another source. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary ascribes two meanings to the word theosophy. First, a teaching about God or the world based on mystical insight. Second, the teachings of a modern movement originating in the United States in 1875 and following chiefly Buddhist and Brahmanic theories, especially of pantheistic evolution and reincarnation. It continues, religious philosophy, theosophy is also a religious philosophy with mystical concerns that can be traced to the ancient world. It holds that God, whose essence pervades the universe as an absolute reality, can be known only through mystical experience. It is characterized by esoteric doctrine and an interest in occult phenomena. Theosophical beliefs are found in Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, and among students of the Kabbalah but Jacob Böhm, who developed a complete theosophical system, is often called the father of modern theosophy. Today, theosophy is associated with the Theosophical Society founded by Elena Blavatsky in 1875. The last source, the Encyclopedia Britannica, states that theosophy is an occult movement originating in the 19th century with roots that can be traced to ancient Gnosticism and Neoplatonism. Forms of this doctrine were held in antiquity by the Manichaeans, an Iranian dualist sect, and in the Middle Ages by two groups of dualist heretics, the Bogomils in Bulgaria and the Byzantine Empire and the Qatari in South France and Italy. So this is how academic publications look at the word theosophy. I thought it was important for us to have this as a background when we try to investigate theosophy in daily life. 
These definitions that I just presented include the words knowledge and system, most of them. In much of theosophical literature, we find descriptions of universal processes, including about the evolution of forms and the unfoldment of consciousness. However, in its essence, theosophy is not knowledge, but wisdom. The Greek word is very clear, theosophia. Sophia in Greek is not knowledge. The Greek word for knowledge is episteme. And it's interesting that in, in these Western academic publications, they have completely ignored one of the words that Madame Blavatsky recurrently uses in relation to theosophy, not only Madame Blavatsky, but also Dr. René Besson, Brahma Vidya, divine wisdom, which has a very profound meaning. We don't have the time here to explore it. Now, wisdom, perhaps we shouldn't be dogmatic about these things, but perhaps one can say that wisdom can only find expression in one's daily life, in how one faces difficulties, suffering, but also how we can open ourselves to the extraordinary beauty which is inherent in every form of life. I don't know if you notice here, but after the very strong rain, the earth released a very beautiful fragrance around here. In one of her articles, Madame Blavatsky described theosophy as the science of life and the art of living. So it's both a science and an art, which means it's not just knowledge. Perhaps it involves some degree of knowledge, but it is also involves art, which in implies sensitivity, receptivity. So, with the time I have left, I would like to explore with you what the three theosophical gems have to say about theosophy in daily life. The theosophical gems being Light on the Path, published in 19, in 1885, The Voice of the Silence, published in 1889, and At the Feet of the Master, which was published originally in 1910. Here. So let us begin with Light on the Path. One quote from each of these books. In part two of Light on the Path, we have rule number eight. This rule says mobile phones in the future will be proscribed in theosophical gatherings. Now that's my amendment. The rule says life itself has speech and is never silent and its utterance is not as you that are deaf may suppose a cry it is a song I shall repeat this life itself has speech and it, it is never silent and its utterance is not as you that are deaf may suppose a cry it is a song this is an extraordinary statement that deserves to be gone into meditated upon in one of the pa passages in the Mahatma letters, life is described in an equally extraordinary way. It says, the expression of spirit in life, sorry, the expression of spirit in matter is life. 
So everything that we see around us, every form of life, is a progressive expression of the uncreated, boundless spirit. That thought alone perhaps should evoke reverence for life, care, compassion. So life is not a cry. The speech of life is a song. We may not hear it. As the quotation says, we may be deaf to it. But there is a song in every form of life. There is a keynote in every person. I would venture to say if this is a fundamental principle, even in those persons whom we disagree with or perhaps we feel indisposed towards, that speech is also there because there is life there. And that speech is a song. A song evokes a very profound state of harmony, of profound sensitivity, but also beauty. And the, listening to this song has to produce a profound state of transformation. Scholars have now said, after researching his teachings, that Pythagoras was able to heal illnesses, including illnesses of a psychological nature, by playing to the patient's acoustic instruments. He believed, probably he knew, that acoustic instruments not only produce harmony, but that harmony and that song and that music produced by the acoustic instruments could mirror the harmony of the person's own soul. And therefore that person could realize that that is his or her true nature and get healed. There is a tribe in Brazil considered sacred by a number of people, the Yanomamis who keep a tradition alive to be the holders of the original stories of this world. Their original stories has, have nothing to do with scriptures of any religion. They have heard it from their predecessors. And one of them said, Hello, Spotty. Um, uh, and one of their elders said that, when the miners and the loggers invaded their land and killed their people, he said, what the white man is doing is cutting himself off from these original stories. Perhaps the original song. We have to move on. The voice of the silence, fragment 2, verse 115, this is very well known. I'm sure many of you have read this and reread it, but I would like to put before you. For mind is like a mirror, it gathers dust while it reflects. It needs the gentle breezes of soul wisdom to brush away the dust of our illusions. Seek, O beginner, to blend thy mind and soul. I repeat, for mind is like a mirror. It gathers dust while it reflects. It needs the gentle breezes of soul wisdom to brush away the dust of our illusions. Seek, O beginner, to blend thy mind and soul another extraordinary statement. Mind is like a mirror. It gathers dust while it reflects. Which means the moment we meet with an experience, the mind is not necessarily fresh, 
it's not necessarily open it is conditioned and conditioning is the dust and what does the dust do it creates a very opaque blurred image of what we see therefore it is true the statement made by J. Krishnamurti it seems to me that what we see is not real in itself because our minds are conditioned and therefore we need to wipe away this dust and the book suggests or the text suggests or the teaching including here suggests that we need the gentle breezes of soul wisdom to brush away the dust of our illusions what we really need is not more knowledge to mention Mr. Krishnamurti again in a talk in New York in 1974 all knowledge is still within the field of ignorance this has references in other traditions as well if you go to the Viveka Chudamani the same statement in different form is made by Sri Shankaracharya as well as in Buddhism and Zen Buddhism and then there is this advice seek O beginner to blend thy mind and soul what does that mean in the middle ages the doctors were trying to search for the soul of human beings so when someone died they would cut that person open and search for the soul they put the brain open and search for the soul they didn't see anything there Madame Malvatsky made a very interesting statement she says the life of the physical brain is activated by a ray of manas one ray of this vast principle of cognition and understanding and perception one ray of that principle activates the brain so the the mind is much vaster than the brain but we interpret our mind our thought processes the book is saying we should blend our mind and soul the soul is of course a much deeper principle in Latin the word soul is anima that means that which is which vitalizes us completely and without which we are not alive finally at the feet of the master he who is on the path exists not for himself but for others this book was written before gender inclusive language was an issue obviously it applies to every human being he who is on the path exists not for himself but for others he has forgotten himself in order that he may serve them he is as a pen in the hand of God through which his thought may flow and find for itself an expression down here which without a pen it could not have yet at the same time he is also a living plume of fire raying out upon the world the divine love which fills his heart is it possible to live not for oneself what does that mean Annie Besant who left us a great deal of her teaching and her experience in her books perhaps more eloquent than her books is the example of her own life if you read about her life when it came to the month of, month of December 
she started emptying out her bank account here. She would write checks to families in need, charities, um, and so many other bodies. When, when, so that when she reached the 31st of December, and that for her was a practice every year, when she reached the end of this 31st of December, she had zero balance in her account. Why? Because she considered that the money that came to her was not hers, but was meant for service. Loka Sangraha in Sanskrit, the welfare of the world. Somebody asked her, Dr. Bezant, and she had a cook who was a former convict. Even nowadays, for a former convict to find employment may not be easy. I don't know the conditions prevailing in, in India. It may be difficult in other countries as well, although there, ha there have been progress in this area to rehabilitate these individuals as they should be allowed to be rehabilitated. When someone heard that she had a convict as her, her cook, she said, yes, he has been with me for 25 years, and that speaks well for both of us. So there are many other examples of someone who doesn't live for himself or herself, and this is the teaching of at the feet of the master. The individual who can come out of this cocoon that we call the personal self, the me, he or she become, uh, let us say, available to a much vaster order of consciousness. And they can touch m many other individuals. Even when they are asleep. That is the story about Angulimala in the Buddhist canon. He was a professional murderer, criminal. He was called Angulimala, or oh, how do you say that there is um, warning content here? Uh, he was a professional thief, and he not only used to rob people, but of every person that he robbed, he would cut a finger. And he would put that finger on a mala around his neck. I have seen the picture of him in a Buddhist temple in Gaul, where the founders took Panchasila in 1880. So the tradition says that when he reached, uh, he, and the Buddha was visiting some place with his arhats or some or and other uh, monks, and all of them were asleep, including the Buddha was asleep. And Gulimala was intent upon assaulting the Buddha. But the tradition says that when he entered the field of awareness of the Buddha, he immediately realized that what he was doing was wrong. And he became a disciple of the Buddha. Anyhow, these are some of the ideas about how uh, theosophy can be made alive in our lives and um, I hope we can all meditate upon them. I would like once again to thank Angels for her presentation during the rain and for preparing this quietness for this presentation. This session is now closed.